Hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, advanced reinforced concrete design. We are going to start with the uh, second module. Uh, the second module is going to talk about the we are going to talk about the material properties. Uh, specifically, uh, we have divided this module into three parts. The first part uh, we are going to talk about mechanical properties of concrete uh, in short term. Okay. The second module we are going to talk about long term properties of uh, concrete. Okay. And uh, the third part of this module we are going to talk about uh, what are the different types of reinforcement available and what are the uh, properties, how do we consider the properties of the reinforcement. So, right. So, we will get started with this uh, module uh, 2.1, which is on mechanical properties of concrete. Right. So, after uh, this uh, module, uh, the expected learning outcomes are the student should be able to list the constituents of concrete and uh, student should be able to differentiate the behavior uh, uh, between high strength and normal strength concrete. Nowadays, I think uh, for different applications, lightweight concrete is also being used. So we will talk about uh, uh, briefly how the lightweight concrete is used in the field, right? And then uh, we will uh, talk about what are the compositions of cement and where are the various types of cement that are available in the market. And we will uh, briefly talk about the hydration of cement that also we will briefly will discuss. And then a student should be able to uh, discuss the stress strain behavior of concrete at compression and tension after going through this module. And uh, the student should also be able to explain the behavior of concrete under multi axial stress. Typically, uh, the concrete elements are subjected to multi axial stress. So, we will talk about how do we consider those things uh, for understanding. And the student should also be able to discuss the failure theories for concrete under combined stress state. And finally, uh, the student should also be able to explain what is called as tension stiffening of concrete. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, concrete, uh, briefly, we talked about the history of concrete in the uh, previous class. Concrete, you know, it consists of uh, uh, cement, which acts as a binder, and then about uh, 70 percentage, 70 to 75 percentage of the volume is occupied by aggregates, so, right? So, you can see we use natural coarse aggregates. Sometimes you also use uh, uh, man-made or artificial uh, synthetic aggregates like the one that is shown here, which is sintered flash aggregate. And we also use sand, a natural sand or manufactured sand for making concrete. So, right. So, uh, and then of course water, we add them to start the hydraulic reaction. and. Uh, uh, and we also add admixtures like the one that is listed here. The admixtures can be broadly classified as chemical admixtures and mineral admixtures. And sometimes we add chemical admixtures to uh, improve uh, the setting time or uh, either to retard or uh, accelerate the uh, setting process. And we also use uh, uh, high range water reducers. And sometimes we also add corrosion inhibitors. So these are all some of the examples of chemical admixture that what we use in concrete. And uh, mineral admixtures, uh, um, some of you may be uh, already knowing that more and more mineral admixtures are being used in concrete. Uh, the popular ones are, of course, the fly ash. And then we have uh, blast furnace slag. Slag also we use. And then we also use metacoilin. And then we also use silica food. So like this, there are also a lot of mineral admixtures uh, that are being uh, used uh, to improve certain properties of concrete, right? Right. So uh, why, for example, this is a, just a, the self-consolidating concrete that you can see here that it's uh, it, it doesn't need any external vibration. If you're able to alter the uh, the mix design, we can get the desired flow properties. Right. So, and why this is important is, you know, nowadays uh, we tend to use uh, for architectural requirements and structural requirements some very heavy reinforcement like the one that you see here. 
so for such kind of uh, scenarios we need to have concrete with very flowable uh, characteristics so uh, we can use uh, 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 both mineral and uh, chemical admixtures to achieve this flowability right so um, so let's see what is high strength concrete nowadays uh, uh, people have been using more and more high strength concrete in fact uh, now ultra high performance concrete is also available people are talking about 150 200 mega pascal of concrete strength so usually uh, when you define the concrete as uh, high strength concrete is uh, as per is 456 the characteristic compressive strength of uh, 150 mm cube at 28 days, if it is between 65 and uh, 100 megapascal, then we term that as uh, high strength concrete. And then if you look at uh, ACA 360R, uh, it specifies that when the strength becomes more than 55 megapascal, then uh, they term the concrete as high strength concrete. Now, why is it important? Because more and more we have been using this in high rise constructions. And uh, so it becomes important for us to understand how this high strength concrete is made and how is it going to behave as a material. Uh, so we have to really understand the mechanics, how uh, this is going to behave. Uh, and we know that the basic uh, from if you have taken the course on concrete technology, uh, if you increase the water cement ratio, in fact, the strength will come down. So one way of actually increasing and going for high strength concrete is to use lesser water cement ratio in our mix design, right? So lesser the water that you have in the system, higher will be the strength. That's called the Abrams law. Uh, you must have studied in your concrete technology uh, course, right? So one way to achieve high strength concrete is use lower water cement ratio, like the one that we see here. And another thing is making optimal use of basic ingredients that constitute normal strength concrete. So uh, what we have seen in the previous slide, we have uh, cement as a binder, and then we have coarse and fine aggregate, and then we add also chemical and mineral admixture. So all these basic ingredients can be uh, optimized. Uh, and for example, how do you uh, reduce the water cement ratio? One way is to use chemical admixture like super plasticizers. Uh, so that with very less water cement ratio, uh, you can still achieve the workability that what you want, right? So in that way, lesser water in the system, then your strength can be increased. Then another way is to add particles such as supplementary cementitious materials like fly ash and silica film, which has uh, various particles of sizes, right? So when you mix everything together with a proper uh, uh, particle packing uh, approach, then for a particular volume, we can really pack uh, materials of different sizes and you end up with a, a very uh, dense microstructure. So that is one another way of making a concrete high strength. And uh, this is what we, we have talked about again in the previous slide. And ACMs, why it is important is they impart additional strength to the concrete. We'll talk about the hydration process in the coming slides. Uh, one of the thing what the ACMs does is it also produce additional cement hydration products uh, and to form the calcium silicate hydrate gels, which is the main uh, strength giving uh, agent in the concrete. So this is the way uh, we usually develop high strength concrete. Uh, as you said, uh, in a typical reinforced concrete construction, the density of the concrete is uh, reinforced concrete particularly is 2500 kilogram per meter cube or if you uh, express in terms of kilonewton it is going to be 25 kilonewton per meter cube. The cell fate from a concrete system is going to be quite large. So how to reduce it in uh, this, uh, the cell fate uh, component? So the one way is to make the concrete lighter as uh, we discussed uh, previously about 70 to 75 percentage of the volume of concrete is occupied by the aggregates. So if we can, uh, you know, uh, choose uh, lightweight aggregate without compromising the other properties, then we can uh, reduce the density of the concrete and that will lead to lesser sulfate in the uh, construction. Right. So the lightweight concrete is usually made by 
replacing the dense natural aggregates with lightweight ones. You have natural lightweight aggregates are also available like uh, pumice and shale. These can be used as aggregate or we also have this uh, man-made synthetic aggregates like the sintered fly ash aggregate and expanded clay aggregates that also can be used for um, making concrete. Now, let's see how different codes classify such uh, uh, concrete according to uh, BS EN 2061. They say that the lightweight concrete has woven dry density of not less than that means the density of uh, lightweight concrete cannot be less than 800 kilogram per meter cube and also it cannot be more than 2000 kilogram per meter cube I, and we know that normal concrete is to, to 2400 so you cannot go as so, so some benefits uh, can be achieved only if it is less than the normal weight concrete so the limit is from 800 to 2000 as per this BA standard now again uh, BSEN 13055 uh, specifies that lightweight aggregate uh, should have particle density of less than 2000 kilogram per meter cube or it should have dry loose bulk density of less than 1200 kilogram per meter cube so the aggregates should also satisfy these density requirements okay then only they are classified as lightweight aggregates again uh, the lightweight concrete can be Classified according to its unit weight or density. Uh, again, they range from 300 to 1900 uh, kilogram per meter cube, 320 to 920 kilogram per meter cube. And uh, this is the way again AC213. Uh, they define the three different lightweight concretes uh, as per these densities that are given here. So when the density is from 300 to 800 kilogram per meter cube, we call them as a low density concrete. And as you can see, if the density is very low, of course, your compressive strength is also going to be low. It is going to be between 0.7 to 2 megapascal. And uh, if your density is from 800 to 1350 kilogram per meter cube, then you classify them as moderate lightweight concrete. But that you can reach a strength of 7 to 14 megapascal. And uh, if you want to use it for structural applications, then usually as per the AC213, uh, the density should be from 1350 kilogram per meter cube to 1920 kilogram per meter cube. Then you can all, you know, even with reduction in density, you can see for 1920, still we end up with a strength of almost, uh, sorry, uh, strength of about 63 megapascal that we get. So that is also uh, you have to keep in mind. So, uh, even with reduction in density, still I can get strength as high as 63 megapascal for structural applications if you design your mixed design properly. So, that is the uh, thing that we do. Again, why is it lightweight concrete is getting more and more popular for certain applications? Because the cell fight is going to be quite significant. For example, if you look at 250 mm thick slab, right? So, the density is going to be 0.25 meter, the thickness multiplied by uh, 25 uh, kilonewton per meter cube. So, you can see that almost it will reach about 6.25 kilonewton per meter square. And usually our live load requirements are in the range of 2.5 to 4 kilonewton per meter square. So, you can see uh, the dense, the, in residential construction, particularly the cell fight is going to be the major load contributor at least from gravity load uh, resulting point of view. Uh, so that is why if there is a possibility of reducing the density of the concrete without compromising the other mechanical properties, then there is a, we can uh, really go and design a very optimal uh, solution for that particular requirement. Right, so we also have codes like this. So for example, the AC9142-1979, it has a specification for artificial uh, lightweight aggregates for concrete masonry units. So there is an Indian standard that is already available for uh, using lightweight aggregates. That too, you can see that it is artificial. That means it's a man-made uh, uh, aggregate using some process, like the one that we seen in the previous slides, which is your uh, sintered flash aggregate or your uh, leka, we call it lightweight expanded clay aggregate. And AC213, you can see that the AC213 also 
gives you guide uh, how to develop uh, lightweight aggregate concrete for structural applications. So you can see uh, in 2014 the, the version is there. So there's already there are codes available how to use this, uh, how to design this lightweight concrete and use it for structural applications. Right. So now let's look at uh, what are the chemical components of the uh, cement. And uh, as you all know that uh, the major, uh, the cement is being produced uh, from uh, lime that, uh, that what you see here and then silica and alumina and then iron oxide. Some addition, addition to that you can also have magnesia and sulfate and hydride. Um, so they are all uh, combined together uh, in kiln and subjected to high temperature to form a clinker. Then the clinker is grind ground to a fine uh, as a fine powder and then uh, uh, gypsum is also added uh, to produce cement okay but these are the main uh, raw materials or ingredients that are used for producing cement now once you produce cement the main reactants that are going to give the uh, the strength or produce uh, calcium silicate hydride gels are basically tricalcium silicate, dicalcium silicate, and the tricalcium aluminate and tetracalcium aluminocarate. These are the reactants that are going to react uh, with uh, water and it is going to produce calcium silicate hydride gels. Right. Now, let's briefly discuss uh, how the reaction of cement is going to happen. Uh, so, uh, usually the cement reactions are uh, hydraulic and uh, hydraulic reaction basically these hydraulic cements are basically inorganic materials that we see uh, that we have discussed in the previous slide. They react with water under ambient conditions to form a hardened and water resistant product. So, this is very important uh, characteristic, right? So, you want uh, the water again, you know, uh, once the product is formed again in when it is exposed to water, it should not uh, dissolve or it no, you know. Uh, so the water resistance and important parameters. As you can see here, we combine cement and water, and the moment water is added, it's going to start the reaction, and you form a hardened product. Now we can also have pozzolanic re reaction. So uh, pozzolanic reaction is a chemical reaction between reactive silica or alumina present in your supplementary cementitious materials, and with the calcium hydroxide that are formed as a in the primary reaction, which we will talk about it in the uh, next slide, uh, in the presence of water at ambient temperature. So, uh, this is called pozzolanic reaction. So, basically, additional calcium silicate hydrate gels will be produced uh, from uh, chemical reactions between reactive silica, that is, and silica or alumina present in your supplementary cementitious material, and the calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is also called as Portlandite. Uh, to form additional calcium silicate hydride gel. So, so this figure clearly explains uh, you have. So, this is your unhydrated uh, cement particle and you can see that after reaction this the light uh, gray color is basically your hydrated cement products either it can be calcium aluminate hydride or calcium silicate hydride gel. Then these are the particles which are calcium hydroxide which are still available uh, which are formed as a part of your primary reaction. This can react with silica that is available, reactive silica that is available in your uh, supplementary cementitious materials to produce additional calcium silicate hydrogen. So, that is what uh, so cementitious bonding products will be formed during hydration and long term uh, pozzolanic uh, reactions. So, in this way, you get additional benefits of using supplementary cementitious materials. Right now, let's uh, uh, talk about. Uh, how these different reactants that we talked about in the previous slide, uh, for uh, these are tricalcium silicate, dicalcium silicate, tricalcium aluminate, and tetracalcium aluminofarate. Right. So this figure explains the degree of hydration. So in the y-axis, when you look at it, so we talk about the degree of hydration by percentage of mass. Okay. And in the x-axis, with respect to days in time. We are talking in terms of days. So, as soon as water is added to cement, of course, the reaction starts, but different reactants react uh, differently. For example, if you look at it, 
C3 and C3S, which are tricalcium aluminate and tricalcium silicate. If you look at it, the degree of reaction is very fast. Almost within a uh, very short time, they are able to reach almost 80 percentage degree of reaction. Right. So, if you want a very fast setting uh, uh, concrete, uh, then your cement composition should have more of C3S. Uh, that is what we have. You know, we'll talk about the classifications of types of cements. So, if you want to have a very fast uh, setting cement, then you need to have more C3S and uh, C3A because these are the product that uh, reacts faster. But if you look at C2S, right? So, if you look at C2S, they uh, basically they react slower and much slower than all the other uh, three, which is C3S, C2S, and C3A. So. Uh, if you want uh, the reaction to be slower in your concrete, then your cement should have higher C2S than C3S. Okay, so these aspects that we need to uh, be careful. All right, so now let's see what are the various types of cements that are available. Uh, in fact, IS 456, our code of practice for concrete construction, uh, it allows us to use three types of uh, grades of cement, I should say three grades of cement, which are 33 grade, 43 grade and 53 grade. And uh, so what does it indicate? So when you mix with your fine aggregate and then make a con make a mortar cube, they should give at least 33, 43 and 53 megapascal. And each grade of uh, cement also should conform to this codes. I, for example, 33 grade should conform to IS-2698. In fact, nowadays the 33 grade is not readily available in the market and only 53 grade is uh, widely available and uh, uh, 43 grade maybe you know uh, uh, you can get it if you try hard. Right. So we also have another uh, type of cement where we call that as a rapid hardening Portland cement. So if you go back uh, previously we discussed the degree of reaction C3S reacts faster. So if you want rapid hardening uh, concrete then your cement also should have higher C3S. Then we also have Portland slag cement and slag is one of the mineral admixtures or supplementary cementitious material that we talked about. So there what they add is, uh, they add uh, with OPC some blast furnace slag. Uh, that, uh, the advantage is you are going to improve the durability properties and also you will get uh, at a later age uh, high strength. Then we also have Portland Pozzolano cement, which should conform to this IS1489, and uh, they are based on flash. So, flash is added, and uh, so you uh, get again less early age, or you will get at a later stage high strength. Then, we also have Portland Pozzolano cement, which is calcined uh, based. Okay, so this is uh, the specifications for this cement is given your IS1489 in part 2. Sometimes uh, for certain uh, specific applications, we also want to have hydrophobic cement. For example, if you want to store the cement for construction, uh, which are exposed to moisture, uh, then uh, this oleic or stearic acid is uh, added to the manufacturing, the manufacturing process that helps to give this hydrophobic property to the cement and it's not going to uh, set okay, while the storing. Uh, you are storing the material. Okay, so this is also is available, and this should conform to your IS8043. Then we have low heat uh, Portland cement. Again, we saw in your degree of uh, heat and hydration process, we saw that C3A and uh, C3S reacts faster, and of course uh, C3S gives you a lot of strength as well. So if you want to have low heat, then what we do is uh, we want to the cement should have higher C2S and also we want to lower this C3. So in this way, uh, you can uh, reduce the amount of heat that is generated during the hydration process, right? And we also have uh, sulfate resisting Portland cement. We will talk about this uh, uh, the effect of sulfate, uh, especially this delayed entering formation and so on. And in this cement, we will have C3A has to be less than five percentage. And combinedly, the tricalcium aluminate and tetracalcium aluminum ferrite combinedly, they should also be less than 25 percentage. 
and uh, we will talk about the mechanisms how this uh, delayed entering gate formation and all can be reduced in the uh, coming uh, um, lectures but this is the way we end up with uh, sulfate resins uh, portland cement especially this is used uh, uh, in uh, for example slab on grade applications or in structural elements which are which are exposed to external sulfate okay so because of the external sulfate you will have uh, delayed entering gate formation that will create uh, some cracking so we will talk about that right so uh, now that we have uh, discussed about what are the types of cement available now let's briefly discuss what is the cement hydration process okay and uh, so if you see here in this figure you have these gray color particles which are cement uh, they are uh, added with water and they are mixed together so initially they are going to be in this fluid suspension and then slowly this uh, tricalcium silicate dicalcium silicate all the components that are in the cement that are going to react with water and then they are going to form this hydration products like the what you see here slowly the size of the cement particle will start uh, reducing and more and more hydration products will be formed around this cement particle right so you can see that that's what you know the amount of water that is available is going to keep reducing uh, because more and more water is being used for forming this calcium silicate hydrate gel but if you uh, really look at it uh, closely uh, right if you look at it sorry. if you look at it uh, closely uh, actually the concrete is porous okay so uh, so if you can see that there is going to be water that is unutilized in the hydration process that is going to stay, still stay as part of the concrete so it is going to have both uh, unhydrated cement like this and then you are also going to have hydration products this all this light gray products are all your hydrated products so they all combine together so when this hydration products form actually the volume also increases so it uh, it becomes like this but when you look at it uh, closely in the uh, hydrated product also so you are going to have again you will have something called uh, gel pore okay in the calcium silicate hydrate gel again you are going to have gel pores where the water will be still there and uh, usually these gel pores are less than 10 nanometers very very tiny and then you will also have basically capillary pores and capillary pores are usually greater than 10 nanometers now one thing that we have to keep in mind is we have to make sure that uh, the capillary pores are not connected together so when uh, porosity we cannot avoid in concrete but we have to make sure that the pores are not interconnected and the concrete is uh, as impermeable as possible uh, so by carefully doing the concrete mix design so again you know calcium silicates that we have seen in the previous uh, uh, slides they react with water and they form products of hydration which are nothing but the calcium silicate hydrates in addition to that you also form calcium hydroxide CaOH2 uh, that is also called as portlandite uh, also it is formed this is the primary uh, reaction uh, for cement chemistry actually uh, what we use is a chemical shorthand for example a represents uh, al2o3 aluminum oxide and then c represents calcium oxide and f represents fe2o3 and water is uh, represented as 2 is represented in shorthand as h in your cement chemistry so you have to keep so when we say c3s actually it indicates 3 CaO and SiO2. So that's what tricalcium silicate, the actual chemical formula is 3 CaO, SiO2. Similarly, for dicalcium silicate, it is 2 CaO, SiO2, and uh, so on. So uh, again, the gypsum, uh, what we add here is basically calcium silicate, calcium sulfate uh, dihydrate, and in short form, it is written as CS bar H2. Okay, this is the way we write in short form. Uh, the gypsum okay and as i said uh, in the initial product the ettringite is also is going to be formed and the ettringite uh, formula chemical formula is 6 eo al2o3 3so3 and 32h2o and in addition to that you also will form calcium monosulfo aluminate and this written uh, the chemical formulation is given here as here so uh, the point is we are going to use this uh, chemical shorthand 
and the C actually indicates calcium oxide and S uh, indicates SiO2, right? And the other things are given here in the slide. 